hello. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Welcome. Uh, I know I'm a new face, um, so I will take a moment to introduce myself. Um, but thank you for joining us on today's weekly walk, November 9th. Um, we're going to be talking about interacting with Central Park's wildlife. Um, and as I said, I realize I'm a new face to many of you. My name is Carla, and I'm the newest tour guide with the Central Park Conservancy. Um, before joining here, um, I was working just a bit uptown, overseeing a greenhouse and education center in West Harlem, uh, located in Riverbank State Park. Um, I went to school to be a high school English teacher, but the past few years I have been working in environmental education, and I've also worked at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden and the High Line, and I'm really excited to be here at Central Park. Um, so thank you very much for joining me on my very first weekly walk. All right. Um, so before we get started, just a little bit of Zoom housekeeping as always. Um, you're probably familiar with most of these features, but you can use the Q&A feature on the bottom to ask a question that you have. And we have my colleagues, Jose and Desiree, as well as Ryan, all of us uh, on the back end to answer your questions. Um, if you'd like to add a comment or just say hello, please place it in the chat. And you can also use the live transcript feature um, for closed captioning. We'll be together for about 15 to 20 minutes or so. Um, and all of the pictures are taken within the last week or so, except for a few exceptions from um, archives. Our mission here, of course, at the Central Park Conservancy is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well being of all. So as I mentioned today, uh, we'll be talking about interacting with wildlife today in the park. Um, this is a picture from the Central Park Archives. I have not recently seen a raccoon in the park, at least not one that is awake and walking around. I've just seen them sleeping in the conservatory garden. Um, but we'll be talking about some of the wildlife that we encounter in the park here and the safe way to interact with that wildlife, which for the most part, um, which we'll say more about, the safest and best way to interact with wildlife is just to simply observe them from a safe distance um, and take pictures and watch them, um, but not necessarily touching them or feeding them. And we'll talk more about that throughout our walk today together. So on our walk, um, we're going to be starting at uh, Pioneer's Gate at 110th Street. We'll take a little walk around the mirror and see what kinds of wildlife we encounter. And then we will head into the North Woods, take a walk um, along the lock and see who we find. And then a last look at the pool before we end our walk today. So here we are at Pioneer's Gate and already before we even get started, um, the fall colors of the park are kind of inviting us to get in and start exploring. And one of the very first kinds of wildlife that we see here in the park, especially on the water, are Canada geese. And one of the very next things that we see on our walk is a sign reminding us not to feed wildlife. Um, so we're not going to be feeding uh, the wildlife that we see today. And we're going to talk a little bit more in more detail about why exactly we don't want to feed the wildlife, why that is not a good idea for us or for the animals. But let's make our way around the mirror a little further. And the next individual that we encounter here is this cormorant, um, which I think of as our kind of resident double crested cormorant. Um, this individual is one of the first things that I encounter when I walk to work in the morning, and it's often the last thing that I see when I walk home at night. So this cormorant has very quickly become very near and dear to my heart. Um, some folks have described cormorants as looking like a combination between a goose and a loon. Um, I think it's a little more attractive than that sounds, um, but often uh, cormorants, I usually see them pretty far out in the water when I've seen them elsewhere in the city, standing on pilings in the water or rocks. And I really appreciate how close I'm able to observe this cormorant. Um, however, I don't get any closer than simply observing the cormorant uh, from the shore. 
And this bird is very patient with folks taking um, its picture as it sits here, often with its wings outspread. As we make our way around the mirror, the next wildlife that we encounter are these turtles. Now, I wasn't able to get too close, thankfully, um, because of these nice plantings along the shore of the mirror. I couldn't get too close to the turtle, so I'm at a nice safe distance. But with the light and the distance, I wasn't able to tell whether these were actually red-eared sliders, um, which are the most common kind of turtle, the most common species that you would see in the park. Now, here's an archive picture of some turtles. Um, so turtles are cold-blooded, which is why when you see them in the park, so often we see them sunning themselves on a rock and often kind of almost cuddling with each other uh, if there isn't a whole lot of room for them to all be on the rock together. Um, but these turtles are another creature that we don't want to feed in the park. Um, turtles naturally tend to eat mostly um, aquatic plants, and sometimes they'll eat some decaying material that they find in the park. Um, so uh, we mentioned that red-eared sliders are one of the most common species that you'll see in Central Park, and there are some other kinds. You'll also see painted turtles, and I guess at some point a diamondback terrapin was also found in Central Park. Um, these are some of our native turtle species. Um, so you might be wondering, how do the red-eared sliders get into the park? Um, they're a very common pet that people receive as a gift. And unfortunately, they're not the easiest pet to necessarily take care of. Um, they need a lot of space. Uh, they can live for up to 30 years and their tanks that you keep them in can quickly smell kind of bad. Um, so sometimes people who receive a turtle as a gift or pet uh, don't necessarily want to hold on to it, and then they try their best to return the creature back to some version of nature, and so they leave it, they bring it to a public park, um, and here the turtles have made their home. Now, I was reading some sources on either side of the debate as to whether these turtles are really causing an issue for our native turtle species, whether they're really out competing our, our native turtles um, who live here in the park. Uh, in some ways, because of what these turtles usually naturally eat, um, they can actually help to keep our water bodies clean and healthy by eating decaying material and eating some um, uh, plant material in the lake. Now, this was not a picture taken in Central Park. This is a picture from the New York Times and it happened not in Central Park, but in Prospect Park. But here is a very good example of something a turtle should not be fed. Um, I can't exactly tell if the goose uh, is jealous of the turtle or perhaps uh, horrified by what the turtle is eating, um, but neither of them should be eating that much pasta. The marathon is over, so no need to carb up, but absolutely not the correct diet for a turtle. So let's keep making our way down the mirror, and ahead I see some more wildlife it looks like, and it looks like we have some Canada geese here. And it looks like they might be enjoying some human food, either shared with them intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and unfortunately, what we also see is that I think four out of five of these birds here are suffering from what's called angel wing, also sometimes called slipped wing or crooked wing. And this is a disease where their wrist joint of the goose uh, grows excessively. And so it starts to grow at the wrong angle. And unfortunately, this, uh, impacts the bird's ability to fly. Um, they're not able to fly once they're, they really have a bad case of angel wing, which then means if the goose can't fly, then it really has a hard time evading predators. So it is definitely a challenge to the goose's um, life and ability to survive. Now, uh, more research needs to be done on what the exact causes and effects are of angel wing. I found some folks who believe that it was most definitely caused by uh, nutrient deficiencies and others that felt that it was a hereditary condition. And other folks feel it's a combination of both, um, that they get angel wing through nutrient deficiencies and then pass it on to their young. Um, but it's important to keep in mind the nutrient deficiencies would be caused by the geese unfortunately being fed too much of the kinds of things we often unfortunately see folks feeding geese. So crackers and bread and chips and uh, snacks that we bring for them, those aren't the right things for geese to eat. 
Um, their natural diet uh, is usually grasses during the spring and summer. And then in the fall and winter, they tend to focus more on seeds and berries just because of the availability of grass uh, would be going down at that time. If they eat too many crackers and bread and things like that, they won't eat enough of the things they should be eating. And so they start to develop a nutrient deficiency and then can suffer from angel wing. Um, and we hate to see this happen to them. It's, it's really not uh, good for them. And then, you know, uh, some folks believe they are then able to pass that off to their young, uh, who would then have the same issue. I understand it can be a tough habit to kick uh, feeding the waterfowl. I hope we, you know, kind of take a moment to just know that it's not good for them, but I understand it's an age old pastime uh, feeding ducks and geese in the park. Um, Hopefully we'll move away from that as we have more information now. But here is a picture of some folks feeding geese and ducks and possibly what appear to be swans um, on the lake in Central Park in the early 1900s. The lake definitely looks a little bit different. And of course, we no longer see swans in the park. Um, I, to my knowledge, the swans in the park were um, the um, trumpet swans. Um, want to make sure that I'm saying this correctly, but I believe that they were, there's a native species of swan. Um, and we, the swans that we introduced into the bark were not the native species, um, and they can easily outcompete, um, you know, the geese and uh, native ducks like the mallards and things like that. Uh, but we no longer find those swans in Central Park. Now, as we make our way around the mirror, looking into the water to see what other kinds of wildlife we might encounter, uh, we see these beautiful asters that appear to just be growing out of the side of the stone and cement border to the mirror. And it's not an animal, but it adds a little bit more wildlife to our walk. We'll keep making our way around and we see some more ducks, and, I'm sorry, geese and turtles. And then we'll head up the path to make our way towards the North Woods. And we'll cross the street here. Ahead, we see our special trash cans that help to protect the wildlife and keep them out of the trash, eating that human food that's not good for them. And we also see a pretty splash of purple over here. And when we look closer, it's some beautiful either New England or New York, New York asters. And these are helping to feed the tiniest wildlife or some of the tiniest wildlife in the park, which are our bees. We'll keep going down the path and we get kind of stopped in our tracks by this beautiful Eastern red bud that almost looks like it's glowing with the sun coming through its yellow leaves. And we'll head up the path to our left here and cross the drive. And we're gonna make our way um, into the woods. So if everyone is ready, we're gonna climb these tall steps. And at the top, as we catch our breath after climbing those stairs, uh, we see another kind of wildlife here. It's not an animal and it's not a plant, it's its own category, it's a fungus. And we don't have to worry about bringing crackers or bread or anything for this fungus because it is feeding itself on this fallen log here. We'll keep following the path, even more fall colors ahead of us, inviting us to keep exploring. And to our right here, we notice this interesting little hollowed out alcove in the bottom of the tree here. Um, and it almost looks like a perfect little home for some kind of wildlife. Unfortunately, it appears that nobody is home right now. So let's keep going. We will pass the block house and we'll follow the path on our left and make it down the drive. And we should be watching where we're going, but I am a little distracted, I don't know about you, by these beautiful red and orange colors of this sumac tree along the drive here. Now we'll get into the shade and head towards the ravine and we'll pass the cascade. And let's walk along the lock and see if we should encounter any other wildlife here. Now, sometimes when I approach the lock as I'm walking through, uh, I sometimes see birds along the shore, um, sometimes squirrels or chipmunks or something. Let's see if we, we can look a little closer in the water and see if we notice anyone. Hmm. There could be someone here under these leaves, but really what stands out to me here are just these beautiful leaves in the water. 
I just love this combination of colors. And it's funny when you just take a quick glance at all of the leaves on the ground, all of the different species that you can notice in a moment. Um, I see some oak leaves, maybe some maple leaves, some different kinds of oak leaves. If there are species that you see here um, that I didn't mention, uh, feel free to name it in the chat. If there's a kind of leaf that you recognize the tree species, please feel free to place it in the chat. And here we can see, it's just kind of a beautiful view of the colored leaves that are falling on the, um, on the water and the water is reflecting some of the, the beautiful skies and the other fall colors happening. Um, and it's just a reminder of how beautiful the ravine looks um, but the ravine is definitely, you know, needs some uh, maintenance and a lot of care from our various teams. So the Conservancy actually did quite a bit of restoration work in the ravine as recently as 2017. Um, what happens in the water bodies is that sediment can accumulate in the locks um, and, you know, the whole area can be impacted by um, dramatic weather events like storms, um, rustic architecture and paths sometimes need to be rebuilt. Uh, and so the Conservancy did a great deal of work in 2017, um, bringing this area back to its uh, beautiful splendor so we can enjoy it. Now I hear some rustling off to my right in the leaves. Let's see if we can see who is over there. Is there something there? Uh, if we look really carefully, um, there is a little chipmunk who is a little too fast for me to get a good shot of. Um, he seems to be darting under a fallen log that's probably protecting his burrow. So here is a better shot of a chipmunk so we can get a clearer look at this incredibly cute little creature. Uh, chipmunks are in the same taxonomic family as squirrels, uh, but they're only about a third of the size of squirrels. They're much smaller. Um, and the little chipmunk that we saw, we mentioned that he was probably escaping into his burrow um, that was under a log. So squirrels, um, they dig these burrows, which they will dig an entrance hole about two inches in diameter. Uh, it doesn't need to be very big because they're very tiny. And then they will um, dig the burrow for about 10 feet, 10 feet long, but not very, not all that far from the soil, about maybe two feet down. Um, and they will dig that burrow and then they will dig different um, chambers off of that burrow for different purposes. So a chamber for storing food, um, a chamber for waste, uh, for going to the bathroom, um, and a chamber even for giving birth and, bear and chambers for sleeping. Uh, so sometimes it seems like chipmunk burrows actually have more rooms than some of uh, our New York apartments do, at least mine. Um, but he is very cute. And just to note one more thing before we keep going on our walk is that um, chipmunks are not susceptible to rabies. Um, so we don't need to really worry about our chipmunks um, having that issue. Now we'll keep going around the mirror and I can't help but notice these beautiful, what appear to be blue wood asters. They just have some really pretty combinations of purple and lavender shades. But let's keep going along here and we're gonna pass under Glenspan Arch. And we can look back at the water one more time and we just, I don't see any wildlife in here, but it is a beautiful pattern. Now, some of what is in the water here could be some of the, uh, it could be some algae bloom as well as things like uh, duckweed and other aquatic plants, but it also gives a, us a, um, we can easily observe here that the water is moving, uh, which is really good for the, the waterway. But we'll make our way down the path and we will come to the pool, come out of the woods here. And one of the first things that we see are some ducks in the pool. It almost looks like they're swimming in liquid gold um, because of the fall colors that are reflecting on the water. I know these ducks are just a little fuzzy. I couldn't see them very well from the edge of the water. Some of the ducks are upside down. And the ducks that we see, it's hard to tell in this light, but I, we see some mallards and there might also be a gadwall somewhere in that group. Here's a nice clear shot of our mallard duck. And I mean, his head almost looks like it's made out of green velvet, uh, but he's looking very nice in the sun. 
Now, ducks are another animal that it's very common um, for folks to want to feed along the shore, um, but it's yet another kind of wildlife that we should not feed. Um, they also have their own uh, natural diets, um, and so it's not uh, it's not suggested to you know feed ducks um, because they could suffer from the same issues, um, you know, such as uh, angel wing and having other issues associated with uh, nutrient deficiency. Um, one of the questions that we get often in the park is, where do the ducks go in the winter time? And it depends on the duck, uh, but these ducks, the mallards, will actually stay right here. Many of our ducks will just stay in the park. They might move on to different water bodies if the water freezes over completely. They might move on to a larger water body that's less likely to freeze. Um, but then there are other ducks who do fly south for the winter, but for them, New York is south. So you can keep your eye out right now um, for buffleheads um, and shovelers. I know I saw one on the mirror just the other day. Um, they'll often have their head kind of routing under the water. So I wasn't able to get a good shot of him because his head was under the water. Keep your eyes out for other kinds of ducks who are in our area for the winter. And we just have a little bit to go before we wrap up our walk. Um, but here are some more ducks as we make our way around the pool. And you may have noticed that ducks often swim closer to the edge of the water uh, when you approach a water's edge, unfortunately, because they're so used to being fed by humans. Um, and another thing to keep in mind as we're walking around these water bodies and we're engaging with animals is that sometimes if you should be someone who has your own animal, such as a pet dog, it's important to remember um, you might need to help your pet uh, be respectful and mindful of how to interact with wildlife in a safe way. Um, animals will be animals, uh, which is why it's best for you to keep your dog on its leash. And just a reminder that off-leash hours in the park are before 9 a.m. and after 9 p.m., but there are some areas of the park that you should always have your pet leashed, um, such as woodlands like the North Woods, and we also don't recommend uh, you should keep your dog out of the water bodies. That helps to protect the ducks. It helps protect your dog also um, because sometimes our water bodies suffer from algae blooms. And we'll make our way a little bit further around the pool, see if we run into anyone else here. And I hear some splashing over in the water. And it appears to be <clears throat> a kind of male duck who's doing a little dance or performance here, uh, trying to show off to some other female ducks in the water. So male ducks, um, ducks will do courtship displays in almost all of the seasons. And so what appears to be happening here is a group of males with a female in the middle, and they will do all kinds of things. They'll hold their head out of the water, they'll hold their wingtips out of the water, they'll sometimes dip their head in and spit water at the female while making weird duck noises. <laughs> um, all of this to try and impress the, uh, impress the female. Here we see yet another male now taking his turn uh, to put on his show. I can't tell if the female is all that impressed, but it's best that we stay at the shore and give them some distance and just allow any possible romances to develop naturally. We're almost done. Um, we'll just take one last look here as we make our way around the pool and wrap up our walk. And I couldn't help but notice looking into the water, um, some sweet gum leaves that are under the water and they almost look like they were preserved in amber or resin or something. Um, but here we see a whole lot of sweet gum leaves under the water. Here are some more geese and a couple of ducks uh, sticking to their natural diet. Uh, of mostly grasses, but again, as we said, more nuts and seeds and maybe some berries into the winter time. And we'll wrap up in just a few more steps here. And oh, we finally encounter a squirrel. It's about time in our last few moments of our walk, we see our Eastern gray squirrel. I thought somehow we weren't going to see any squirrels on our walk today. Um, there are quite a few squirrels in the park, obviously. Um, I feel like I've been seeing more squirrels in the park uh, lately, but maybe I'm just spending more time in parks than I used to. Uh, squirrels weren't always in the park. They were actually introduced into Central Park sometime in uh, the 1870s. Um, 
they had mostly uh, not survived in the park because of industrialization and urbanization and uh, deforestation. There weren't so many squirrels found in Central Park or in the city, uh, but many cities wanted to add squirrels to their parks uh, as something interesting for visitors to see. And so they, um, they released squirrels. Now, many cities who tried to introduce squirrels, the squirrels unfortunately died off because they did not have enough food and habitat. But the New York City parks, uh, they actually provided um, squirrel nesting boxes so that they could survive. And they also gave peanuts to the visitors. Uh, so I guess they didn't have don't feed the wildlife signs up back in those days. Um, but now, obviously, our squirrels have plenty of trees and acorns, and they can take care of themselves. And they, too, should never be fed by us. Um, they are wild animals, and it's best for them to fend for themselves and eat their own diet. Um, I've been seeing, as I said, lots and lots of squirrels in the park. Um, we, if you're wondering exactly how many squirrels are in Central Park, uh, you might want to check out the squirrel census that was done in 2018. Uh, there is a website for that that you can uh, Google the squirrel census and find out exactly how many squirrels were found in the park and read some heartwarming details provided about their, uh, their fur and their behavior. But this is our, our last look at the pool. Um, beautiful colors right now to enjoy in the park and beautiful reflections on the water. There's lots of wildlife that we didn't see today that perhaps we'll encounter and talk about on another weekly walk. Um, but I wanna thank you so much for joining me today. Um, coming up in the future uh, is uh, the Iconic Views Tour. Um, it'll be a special holiday um, scheduling of this on Sunday, Sunday, December 25th at 11 a.m. Um, and I apologize, I totally forgot to uh, share your um, poll that I'll launch just as I'm saying my concluding words, but you can let us know um, what your favorite wildlife is in Central Park. Um, and as we're wrapping up in our last minute, uh, it looks like, feels like, uh, we're counting an election here or something. Uh, it looks like birds uh, are pulling ahead, uh, which makes sense, but I can't decide and I love all of them is definitely um, a close second. So it's kind of neck and neck between loving all of the wildlife um, or loving birds best. Uh, and you can certainly in our last moments throw in the chat any specific wildlife that you love. But thank you for participating in that. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining me on my very first weekly walk. Um, it was a pleasure to be with you and to get to meet you. Um, and that's about it. Uh, so we wish you the best and we hope you stay healthy and be well on behalf of Central Park Conservancy.